This is a picture of a killer. Black lung disease remains the scourge of coal country. Black lung disease kills, and it's once again on the rise. Long-term exposure to coal dust causes the disease. Coal workers' pneumoconiosis, sometimes referred to as black lung. In April 1831, Scottish doctor James C. Gregory performed an autopsy on his former patient, John Hogg. Hogg had worked in the Scottish coal mines for 12 years, and prior to his death, had visited Dr. Gregory complaining of shortness of breath and chest pain. He soon developed a terrible cough and was bringing up an inky, viscous liquid. Less than a month later, John Hogg was dead. Dr. Gregory speculated that the cause of death was related to Hogg's occupation as a coal miner, more specifically, the dust he had been breathing in for those 12 years. This was the earliest diagnosis of what we today call coal workers' pneumoconiosis, or CWP, known by various other medical names in the past, including miners' consumption, miners' asthma, miners' anemia, and anthracosis. Most of us know the illness today as black lung disease. This disease is responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of coal miners across the world since the advent of coal mining. But if the disease was identified as early as the 1830s, why was it left to devastate the coal working population for so long? Those working the coal mines of Great Britain and the United States were massively impacted by the disease until the 1950s and 1960s when government regulation only started to take more notice of the problem. The eventual steps that were taken by governments to combat the disease fortunately brought black lung disease under control. By the 1990s it was thought to be almost entirely eradicated. Today however the trend has reversed with new spikes and numbers of those affected clearly demonstrating that the disease is coming back with a vengeance. But what could be causing the return of a disease which has now been known for nearly two centuries and is entirely preventable? Carbon is the most abundant element on Earth. Coal is formed when partially decomposed plant material is heated and compressed deep underground over millions of years. While coal as a source of fuel and heat is known to have been used as far back as 4000 BC, its use was fairly limited until the start of the Industrial Revolution in about 1760. Coal was the economic backbone of the rapidly industrializing West, due in part to the transition from the water wheel to the steam engine and the use of coal in iron ore smelting which so greedily consumed the material. In the United States, commercial coal extraction began in Virginia in the 18th century and quickly spread across some 20 states to meet regional, national, and export demands. By 1900, the USA was responsible for one-third of the world's total coal output. The United Kingdom saw the same surge in coal output during the Industrial Revolution, but by the early 1970s, the industry had all but disappeared and today output is down 90%. Global use of coal peaked in 2013, and by 2020, coal still supplied one quarter of the world's energy needs and was used to generate more than one-third of our electricity. Despite the development of renewable energy technologies and the push towards cleaner energy sources, coal still very much remains a central part of the global economy, particularly for those still developing countries. The largest producers of coal today are China, India and still the United States. Continued exposure to coal dust inhaled into the airways and lungs overwhelms our respiratory system's defences, causing inflammation. In its most serious form, the inflammation causes scarring on the lungs, known as pulmonary massive fibrosis, or PMF. Where the lungs have been damaged badly enough, the victim will suffer from hypoxemia, which is low blood oxygen levels, and will be reliant on oxygen tanks to survive. The disease, for which there's no cure, has been called black lung disease because of the discoloration of the lungs from the coal dust. In 1881, a professor of medicine at the University of Denver presented a paper at the Colorado State Medical Society's annual meeting. He dramatically announced to his audience that the final sentence of his presentation had in fact been written using the inky fluid taken from the lungs of one of his patients. The other primary forms of pneumoconiosis are asbestosis and silicosis, which as the names imply are caused by inhaling asbestos fibers and silica dust respectively. Silicosis also remains a major problem for coal miners who are exposed to silica dust when drilling and cutting into rock to reach coal seams and deposits. If you can imagine inhaling silica dust as breathing in microscopic glass, you'll have a pretty good idea of the effect silica dust has on the lungs. At the risk of stating the obvious, coal mining has always been dangerous. From deadly fires, mine shaft collapses and cave-ins, to carbon monoxide poisoning and methane explosions, 
miners have had a lot to contend with. Occupational fatalities among coal miners were extremely high, with 1,000 coal diggers dying per year from traumatic injuries during the 1890s. It was this spectacular injury rate which diverted attention from the problem of black lung disease, which only presented its effects many years after the fact. Whether mined on the surface or deep underground, miners are continuously exposed to dust from coal and the other rocks that they have to break up in the process. Underground coal mining involved digging an initial tunnel near the coal seam, undercutting and propping up the seam with a piece of wood called a sprag, drilling a hole with an auger and then shoving in a cylinder of black powder. After lighting the fuse, the miner would run for cover. The ensuing blast would hopefully dislodge a ton or more of coal. You can imagine the dust cloud that would be kicked up from the blast. This combined with the smoke from the black powder and the odour of burning oil lamps meant that fresh air was a luxury, especially as the miners went deeper underground. Once the dust had settled, which is said purely metaphorically here, the coal would be loaded into mine carts and heaved to the surface. Anthracite mines, especially in Pennsylvania and the US, would also have what was called a coal breaker. This was a type of processing plant where coal would be sorted based on size and impurities such as slate and other rock would be removed and discarded. Working at the breaker was typically the starting point in a miner's career and in many cases it was children who sat at the breakers inhaling the clouds of coal and silica dust kicked up in the sorting process. Children as young as six years old were known to leave school to work in the mines, usually joining a father or mostly other male family members. Since the decision to work at the mine meant leaving formal education, these children would often see out the rest of their working lives as coal miners. Both the United Kingdom and the United States introduced legislation outlawing the employment of children at coal mines, but these laws were seldom strictly enforced and set very low age restrictions to begin with. Ventilation of mines is critical to miner well-being, and while such systems were available from early in the 20th century, they were expensive. Ventilation in its earliest form was also itself quite dangerous, as fires and various trapdoors were used to draw fresh air down into the mine shafts. Mine owners were, however, alive to the risks associated with methane gas explosions, and, not wanting to compromise their investment, typically ventilated the gassy mines more frequently than the non-gassy mines. As technology developed, well-ventilated mines used rotary fans in a system of razors and ramps. But the technological advances of coal mining was in some ways a curse for the coal miner. Mechanization actually increased the dust generated from mining as machines and drills tore through and into rock and coal more quickly and more violently than ever before. An axiom of coal mining was always that it went hand in hand with miners' asthma. Everyone knew that the dust affected the miners, that they developed terrible coughs and had trouble breathing, but the long-term damage it seems prior to the mid-1950s was simply not understood. All manner of home remedies and panacea medicines were peddled to the miners, some offering more of a distraction than any actual medicinal effect. For many decades, mining was largely unregulated in America and the United Kingdom. When unions were formed, they were initially more concerned with wages and maintaining hard-fought retirement funds. Increased productivity through mechanization was therefore the goal for both mine owners and the unions, and issues such as chronic disease took a back seat. The disease was so prevalent that between 1970 and 1974, 32% of coal miners having worked 25 years or more in the mines had the disease. In America, it was only in 1969 that CWP was recognized as a truly dangerous disease. The United States introduced the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act after much pressure from the United Mine Workers of America, its members and lobbying groups comprising, among others, the many widows of dead miners. The plethora of health and safety regulations included prescribed limits for exposure of coal miners to dust. This act also implemented a health and screening program. Then President Richard Nixon intended to veto the legislation. But in response, 1,200 West Virginia coal miners downed tools and threatened to call for a nationwide strike. On the 29th of December 1969, a delegation of seven widows whose husbands had died in a mine explosion the year prior arrived at the White House to demand the passage of the legislation. To avoid the strikes and because he could not bear to face the widows, the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act was signed into law. Compensation schemes in both the US and the UK were introduced to compensate miners for their suffering and to support the widows and families of miners who succumbed to the disease. The legislation helped to support suffering families' financial troubles and reduce cases of black lung disease by up to 90% in the United States. By 1990, just 4% of underground coal miners working for 25 years or more had the disease. After 1990, this downward trend began to reverse. From 2005 to 2006, the rate of black lung disease had increased to 9%. So despite all the lobbying, protesting and legislation, miners were still getting sick and they were still dying. Many mines operating today in the USA are not unionized. 
and some argue this as a primary reason for the health and safety of miners once again taking a back seat. Also, operators of small mines often now extract coal from thin seams that were once considered unminable or not profitable. Technological advances have made it now possible and profitable to mine these thinner seams, but this means drilling through increasingly larger quantities of rock to access the coal. To state the obvious, more rock equals more dust. Coal mining is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. Despite the gains made against the spread of black lung disease over many decades, it is clear that the fight continues. Notwithstanding all that we know about how to prevent the disease, scores of miners even today continue to dig their own graves.